made me want to genuinely learn more about dinosaurs. I bought these books? I'm learning? No, wait, the universe is off balance. I have to do something stupid. All aboard the dinosaur train in my mouth. <laughs> I just realized that chickens are one of the closest descendants to dinosaurs. So this would be like if somebody ate Neanderthal-shaped human nuggets. Oh my god. To the show. Are you? Are you? Butt lovers. <laughs> Welcome back to the lore series where we explore shows and commercials that one time that no one else is brave enough to. Today we are talking about the series Dinosaur Train. Now this show is even better than I remember it being and it ran even longer than I thought it did. This PBS Kids show ran from 2009 to 2020 with five seasons and a hundred episodes overall. And I watched every single one. And there was also a movie that came out in 2021. This series was created by Craig Bartlett, who also created Hey Arnold. It is also known as Jim Henson's Dinosaur Train, which is a little strange when you associate Jim Henson with things like this. But trust me, it'll come full circle later. The Jim Henson Company was a distributor as well as one of the production companies. On top of that, two of the executive producers was Brian Henson and Lisa Henson, son and daughter of Jim and Jane Henson. And just to reiterate, this show is so good. Are there any bad PBS kid shows? Leave in a comment if you can think of any because I am determined to find one. They can't all be bangers. Oh. In the series, we follow the Pteranodon family, which the theme song sets up quite nicely. Also, I don't even have to say it. It's so good. Mr and Mrs. Pteranodon have four kids, three Pteranodons, Tiny, Shiny, and Dawn. And if you can believe it, Tiny says, wait, there's one more mom. And the last little baby was a different size with teeth and a tail and big green eyes. I'm sorry for monologuing or songologuing, but in my defense, it is very fun. Oh, this is your family and I'm your mom. Anyway, three Pteranodon kids and their brother, Buddy, who's a T-Rex. Going over their family dynamic, uh, they're perfect. They're a perfect loving family and you'll see that the more we talk about them. Buddy is the smartest, always saying he has a high hypothesis, a theory you can test, and is the most obsessed with the dinosaur train. Tiny is quite outgoing with a talent for making up rhymes, which seems like a waste of time, but it's not a crime to enjoy a rhyme, let her shine. But Tiny also enjoys her alone time. When she says that she needs to be by herself, she says she's going to her tiny place, which is just a hole in a tray. Teaching kids about boundaries, a++, absolutely. But who's gonna teach the parents? Not everyone is as cool as Mr. and Mrs. Pteranodon. Sometimes, I wish I was the adopted child. Aww. That's really fucking weird, go to therapy. Don likes digging holes, eating bugs, and he also has a catchphrase, which isn't really a phrase at all. La la lu. It's more of a vocal stim, I think, and it has no right to be as catchy as it is. I've been la la looing all over the place. La la lu. Send help. Next I have to talk about Shiny, and Shiny Hun, I'm so sorry. For whatever reason, as a kid, I thought you were an asshole, a little shit perhaps, but you're perfectly fine. You're really nice, in fact. If I'm being honest, I think I was just jealous. Aww. That's really fucking weird. Go to She's therapy. different. She's special. Can't believe I was jealous of an animated bird child. I'm Tarana Dunn. <laughs> now for the conductor of the dinosaur train. He is a Troodon and will never fail to remind you that Troodons are the smartest dinosaurs. Okay, Flex. He's a Troodon. They're the smartest dinosaur. Yeah, he's always saying that. I had to mention him here, but I can't say more without getting ahead of myself. Because these Troodons are not natural. Speaking of unnatural. The dinosaur train, the titular character, is a train that travels through time up and down the Mesozoic era. Here's your fair warning now that while the show is educational, this video will not be. Due to the nature of what I'm talking about, there'll probably be dinosaur facts sprinkled throughout, but if you only want that, watch the show or watch a documentary or something. Because here we talk about the things that are clearly fantastical that you're supposed to suspend your disbelief for, but I will not. Why does this train have a tail? Is it alive? I wanna read over some of my bullet points from the first episode of the show to show you my first impressions before we go over the format and what you can expect if you ever decide to watch. But first, huge disclaimer, the Amazon Prime order is as usual absolute ass and not in a good way, and the Schmalegal site I used to use also turned into a subscription service, uh -huh. which completely defeats the point. So I resort to Amazon Prime and Calm down, Athena. I had to search for the first episode. The very first episode of the show is Amazon Prime's season six, episode one. Remember how I said there's only five seasons? So why are there 11 on Amazon Prime? If that isn't enough, the first two episodes of season three are an arc about an adventure camp. But Amazon Prime has decided that these two episodes are their own series. 
Sure. Another quirky Amazon Prime moment. I had to search for the season four episode Spooky Tree because it turns out it was in a collection of PBS kids spooky stories. This review hits the nail on the head. The image gave my kids and I the impression that there would be spooky excerpts for multiple PBS shows per episode. Instead, we just paid for an episode of Dinosaur Train, one we'd already seen. Why is Amazon Prime like this? You got the rights to a show. For people to access it, not only do they have to pay for Amazon Prime, but they have to subscribe to the PBS Kids subscription as well, and you can't even get the fucking order right! All right, enough of that. In the very first episode, we go on the dinosaur train, and the conductor punches tickets with his toes. Ew! Put those little piggies away, conductor. Oh, oh. Oh, so when he does it, it's, wow, look at that Troodon claw. And when I do it, it's, ma'am, you're disturbing the other passengers. <sighs> they then travel through the time tunnel and allegedly travel 10 million years where they meet this Jimmy Neutron Megamind looking ass. Big Head over here is a Stygy Mullock, if you're curious. Let me see if I can find him in my book. Little horned dragon-like biped that browsed on bushes and ferns around Lake Cretaceous, South Dakota. Look at these pictures. <laughs> there are multiple arcs in this show, and none of them last very long. For example, the very first one is Buddy having an identity crisis because he doesn't know what species of dinosaur he is. Kind of wild they didn't tell the Pteranodon family what baby they were adopting. Because despite how it sounds in the theme song, the egg wasn't just dropped off at their nest. Mr. and Mrs. Pteranodon went to an adoption center and picked out an egg, not knowing what was inside. Given the fact that there are prey and predators, that's very brave of them, A. Eh? And B, with the technology you see throughout the series, it is absurd that they didn't have a way to identify and classify this egg. But in season one, episode four, entitled I'm a T-Rex, whoa, spoiler alert, we find out what Buddy is. He's a T-Rex. A part of this episode that really irked me is when Buddy went up to the conductor and was like, conductor, I'm a T-Rex. And the conductor was like, of course you are. How didn't I realize? But then at the end of Buddy's song, he turns to another passenger and said, you know, I always had a feeling he was a T-Rex. And I have a feeling you're either a liar or an asshole. Why wouldn't you tell the kid what he is when he was wondering for so long? Other arcs include Dinosaur Big City, A to Z classification arc, the biggest dinosaur arc, Arc, adventure Camp, Dinosaur Train Submarine, and so on and so on and so on. One thing you need to know is if you hear a song once in this series, get ready to hear it again and again and again and again. I understand repetition is a great way for facts to stick in the brain. That's the reason why when the T-Rex song started, I started singing along before I even realized I remembered it. T-Rex war, I'm a Tyrannosaurus. I'm the biggest carnivore in the Cretaceous forest. Catchy and cute. Less cute the seventh time. But whatever, I'm not their demographic. Obviously. Something else I found interesting is that not all the lessons revolved around dinosaurs. There were some about the weather, some about geography, a handful about emotional intelligence. Yeah, I don't like fighting, buddy. You're the one who started it, tiny! And many about trains. Which shouldn't have surprised me, that's that's one half of the show. I mean, the whole pitch for this show kind of sounds like, hmm, what are the two most popular hyperfixations? Let's just push those together. It makes me giggle that there's a demographic of this show that's like, all oh, right, enough about the dinosaurs. Let's hear about the trains. When you see a picture of a Stigimolic, what's the first thing you notice? Acorns on its head. Ball! Dinosaur Train has the kids pointing out features of different creatures, and they're just encouraging kids to observe the world around them. But some of the things they say come across as semi-rude. Like, whoa, your head's so big! Or check out this clip I took. How can you eat so much so fast? I like to eat. Is that such a crime? Season one, episode seven A, back at it again with the rude questions. And this one doesn't even make sense. Tiny asks a velociraptor, if you have feathers, why can't you fly? I don't know, Tiny, if you don't have feathers, why can you fly? Idiot. Interaction between these species also includes, there's so much tension in this screenshot alone, I don't remember this plot point. Firstly, Irma and the conductor are seeing each other and I don't know what to do with this information. One can even say he's gonna 
Railroad. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but this brings up an interesting question. How is this going to work if they're different species? So I looked up if different species of dinosaur have ever mated, and the short answer is yes, but it's not often. Also, why do I feel like the conductor would be cancelled for this? She's from a different time period. She's millions of years younger than you, bro! Smartest dinosaur but couldn't be with somebody from your own time period? If I were to travel back in time and fuck a caveman, that, that would be weird, right? asking for a friend. This is also not a one-off thing. There are many episodes where they get together and what they really need to get is a damn room. Shiny also has a crush on the conductor's nephew, Gilbert, so it's undeniable that the Troodons have an amount of, and this is the first time I'm saying this, Riz, and it's suspicious. I also knew as soon as I saw and heard the conductor's rival, Thurston, that there would be a lot of fan fiction of the two of them, and I was not wrong. There are also real-life humans that think the conductor is a snack. That helps scare off the meat eaters. Sometimes. The harsh reality of nature cuts through this series like a knife sometimes. Because of course they want to be accurate and show the food chain as it really was. In season 1, episode 11a, Derek the Deinonychus and his family puts emphasis on the training of his giant claw, which he uses to, in their exact words, stab the dinosaurs they eat. Really not sugarcoating it. I have a theory that dinosaurs only eat other dinosaurs that they don't get along with or don't care enough to befriend. So it's always personal. Oh, you're boring? Chomp. Oh, you're a jerk? Chomp. Season 1, episode 16, B Fossil Fred, they discover the tooth and then full skeleton of a dinosaur that died millions of years ago. The conductor says it was probably a dinosaur that lived in the Jurassic period. They've been to the Jurassic period. That could have been the bones of their friend. And they just don't care. Deinonychus probably did use their terrible claws to catch other animals. Yay! Why are you cheering? In season 1, episode 31b, the stakes are for the first time and only time, I think, ever, life and death. Mr. Pteranodon and Larry the Lambiosaurus are stuck in a mud pit and they have to get out before the meat eaters come and kill them. Big meat eating carnivores. You had to stop and eat the leaf. In season 2 episode 4b, the lesson of everything changes is presented when Tiny is very upset that her favorite flowers died. I too fear death and I think that Tiny is very justified in her reaction, but it's very interesting because you'd think they'd have a similar reaction about the dinosaur remains they found last season. They even named the bitch Fossil Fred, not realizing he's fossil dead. Season 2, episode 19a, Tiny hears that a Dinosuchus, a large crocodile, eats pteranodons. And her first instinct is like, oh, we should meet her. Tiny has no survival skills, and neither does her family for going along with this. Your lifespan's gonna be tiny if you keep this up. Throughout this episode, it really seems like the Dinosuchus was trying to lure them in and then try and launch at them, and it would be this, you know, stranger danger lesson. But that doesn't happen. I guess danger to the children is a line this show won't cross. Go for Animal Planet. Let's see them brawl. No, I'm kidding. I get that it would kill the vibe, but then why bring up the main character's species in the food chain at all? Because I guess it's less bad if the main character is the one to do the killing. Season 5, Episode 9. This is Buddy's first time going hunting, and it is said explicitly that he's hunting a group of quadrupeds. We even see them before they get devoured. Pretty hardcore. He's not a vegetarian, and I am fucking scared of him. His brother and sisters ask him how was it, and specifically if he used his T-Rex senses. That's not the questions I would be asking. I'd be like, how did it feel murdering those Triceratops? You know, the same species as your friend Tank? Was he there? Did he see you do it? This show gets grim sometimes. Look at this clip. Mom, are other asteroid rocks going to fall on us like that seed did at home? That will not happen, dear. I had the same concern when I was a Troodon tot, and Mother told me not to worry. Asteroids hardly ever hit the Earth. Mom and Mr. the Conductor are right! Yeah, I mean, what are the odds an asteroid would hit us? What a sick sense of humor this show has sometimes! Look at the mom's face when he asks. She is lying through the teeth she doesn't have. They know. I think they know. And there's something you should know before I spiral out of control about time travel, and that is... Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. In true PBS kids show fashion, there is a time tiny short between the two episodes. It is here that we meet Dr. Scott the paleontologist, who always presents us with dinosaur facts. But after the episode Buck Tooth Bucky, he just casually drops the coolest shit I've ever heard in my life. In fact, I discovered some of Mashikasaurus' first bones and gave this dinosaur its name. And as if that wasn't enough, season 2 episode 7a, Dr. Scott also named the Utah Ceratops, and also the Cosmoceratops. Cosmoceratops. I know quite a lot about this creature because I was one of the scientists who studied its bones, and I was even lucky enough to name it. So at this point, I looked it up, and apparently, according to this article, he's named 50 
15 dinosaurs so far. This guy is so cool. I want to be a paleontologist when I grow up. I say at 24 years old, knowing damn well I don't have the patience. Also, while we're here, Amazon Prime gave me another reason to put them on my shit list. Because what is the season 4 premiere Dr. Scott erasure? During the transition of the first episode into the next, there was no Dr. Scott. And yet, this happened. Look at these captions. He wasn't there, but his absence was felt. The time travel and technology of the dinosaur train is questionable, to say the least. Episode 12A of season 1, the train breaks down. I'm telling you, I don't think they're advanced enough to perfect time travel if they can't make a train that doesn't break down when a nut falls from the tree into the engine. And remember how I talked about the discovery of Fossil Fred, and how they don't think about for a moment that they've been to the time period they're saying this skeleton is from, and that this could potentially be one of their friends. Season 1, episode 23B, Mrs. Pteranodon, Buddy, and Tiny are excited to meet Tank the Triceratops' new baby brother that's hatching today. But to visit them, they have to go through the time tunnel to another part of the Cretaceous period. Do you see what the problem is here? If you're traveling through time and are talking to somebody that lived in a different time period as you, how are you keeping up with them in the present? How are the eggs hatching, something that's happening right now? Couldn't you have visited this moment at any time with the dinosaur time travel train? This happens again in Season 1, Episode 40A, when Irma, all the way back in the Triassic, says, I heard about your junior conductor, Jamboree. How? I'm sorry, what is this timeline? One could argue that the train stations are fixed to a certain time and age day by day along with them, so you can keep up with people because they're moving forwards at the same pace you are. This is also the reason why Buddy and his family aren't running into future versions of themselves, so I guess this checks out. In the episode Dinos A to Z Part 2, Tiny says we need to find a Cretaceous and Jurassic bird to fly around for us. Then, both the Cretaceous and Jurassic bird fly onto the train. Tiny tells them to fly around the Cretaceous and Jurassic to spread the word about their picnic slash sing-along. This is strange because after being given this information, both of the birds fly away. Neither of them stay on the train. So this implies that one of those birds can fly to the time that they were told to go to. I don't know what time period they were currently in on the train, so... But one of them definitely has to go back to a different time. This directly contradicts the season one episode Tiny's Tiny Doll. When some flying guy is trying to get Tiny her doll back, and the whole stakes is that he has to do it before the train train goes through the time tunnel. Classic in the Jurassic is a four episode event in which the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous compete against each other in different sports. Different teams for us are usually associated with location, state, or country, or college. So with access to different time periods, this is further proof that the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous can almost be treated like physical locations. Like in Season 3, Episode 3B, when Buddy from the top of a mountain goes, I think I can see the entire Cretaceous from here. Buddy knows damn well he's talking about a time period that lasted 79 million years and not a place, so... What's up with that? The only thing we know for sure at this point is that they're limited to the Mesozoic era, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Whether it's the literal time periods or just a simulation of what it was like back then, until Season 3, Episode 11B, Back in Time. The conductor and kids are talking about the Permian time period, a time before dinosaurs. And as always, the kids are taking this existential truth bomb like champs. But anyway, apparently there is a walk-in time tunnel that goes way back before the Mesozoic. I am officially unconvinced. The only original time travel rule of just the Mesozoic has been shattered. And this shit looks like one of those fun house mirror things that is seen in Ripley's Believe It or Not museums. Please. Starting to think it's all smoke and mirrors. Actually, my skepticism began all the way back in season one, episode 3B, when I wondered, how do they deal with bringing back flowers, fish, and other stuff from different time periods? Not just with time paradox stuff, but even just with the ecosystem. And my question was answered in Season 4, Episode 5A. Apparently many years ago, the conductor brought a Changiraptor family to Iguana Island and they wanted to stay and live there. Now the ecosystem is all out of whack because the Changiraptors the conductor brought there ate all the lizards. He takes no accountability for this. You think the smartest dinosaurs with their many, many inventions would know how serious this offense is. Oh, how many inventions you said? <laughs> 
while the Troodons, of course, made the dinosaur train. Dinosaurs from all over the Mesozoic era come to Troodon Town to celebrate the fabulous dinosaur train built by the amazingly smart Troodons. And in Season 2, Episode 18A, Dinosaur Train Industries solved a problem that was presented as early as Season 1, Episode 8A. The largest dinosaurs used to not be able to ride the dinosaur train, but now they can with the flat car. It's just a slab of wood on wheels. I don't know how they didn't think of that sooner. The conductor also always teaches the kids lessons. Now, when he does this, he pulls down a screen that aids in the visuals of whatever he's talking about. When he pulled down the screen in Season 1, Episode 14B, he had videos of the Pteranodon family's friends hatching. Look, it's baby Tank! How? Season 3, Episode 11B, the conductor showed us this image. Uh? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? I gasped. Because this image wasn't shown to us by Dr. Scott. This image was shown to us by the conductor. Like I said, how does he know about these creatures? These present day creatures on the bottom here? People might say that this proves that the dinosaur train can also travel into the future. And maybe it can, but I think that this is truly just a simulation, as I said before. I think these dinosaurs exist in the present, like a Jurassic Park situation. Something brought the dinosaurs back. Maybe it's humans, maybe it's aliens, maybe it's something else. And they live in these different areas designed to look like and feel like different time periods when really they're just traveling through space not not space like ooh the stars and stuff just just like moving from here to like here We've seen underwater time tunnels and underwater stations. And then in season two, episode 23A, we have the brand new submarine. They're OP, I swear to God. We also see them trying to improve the dinosaur train with competitors such as the rocket train and the solar powered train. They're already thinking about renewable energy. And in the same episode, the solar train was introduced. They also have FaceTime? I mean, it was kind of implied that they were talking to people in different time periods, even when they weren't right next to them. So I had a feeling they were calling people, but this is the first time we saw it. And at the end of the very same episode, they solve a problem by creating batteries. This is the first time they thought of batteries and yet, FaceTime exists. Suspend your disbelief. I will not. Season 3, episode 12 to season 3, episode 13 introduced the dinosaur train Zeppelin. And isn't it wild that the conductor knows how to pilot a Zeppelin as well as operating trains and submarines? They went to conducting school, but like the Zeppelin and submarine are new technology that seemingly comes naturally to them. Flip the D and throw it on, get rid of one of the extra O's. What is that spell? Robot! There's a whole what's at the center of the earth special, and they have a drill train because of course they do, and this led me down a hole. Ah! I googled how far have humans drilled into the earth, and turns out we haven't made it past the crust. And according to Let's Talk Science.ca, we actually know more about outer space than we know about what's under the earth's surface. Totally fun, fun fact that doesn't make me question everything at all. So in this episode, they also only explore the crust. And Dawn was just as clickbaited by this title as I was. What's at the center of the Earth? They don't know. In season 5, episode 4a, there are dinosaur paleontologists, and they're all troodons. And in the series finale before the movie came out, season 5, episode 11, Father's Day, not only do we find out that Troodons are the only species to live in houses, all the other dinosaurs live in nature, but, but they live in houses, but we also find out that the conductor's dad traveled to the future into the Ice Age and has been stuck there. When the conductor finds a way to travel there, he announces that they're in the Cenozoic era. Mr. Pteranodon then says, How do you know what it's called? To which the conductor replies, Well, that's what the instruments say, so... Further confirmation that this tech was given to them. Robots have taken over. Okay. Also, the Trodons are so fascinated with the future. It's almost as if they know something and are trying to prevent it, which would also explain them gatekeeping technology so they can use it daily. Meanwhile, other species have to evolve and develop naturally with no daily access to FaceTime or furniture or clothes. So I tried to dig deeper and Google Troodon. I'm so brave for that. Maybe their species is just as suspicious. And I found out they are described as a wastebasket taxon. Harsh. People even argue if it's 
still a valid species. So these guys are more controversial than I thought. Time tunnel. The only thing that discredits my this is the second coming of dinosaurs and they aren't actually traveling through time theory is that they're constantly pulling up pictures of the continents drifting apart. They've also allegedly been to Pangaea. The only thing that gave me hope is that we never saw a train exit a tunnel that looked totally different than the one they entered in. But in season three, episode 13, we see a tunnel from both sides somehow. In one side, out the other. Now a body of water does appear there, but that's the only thing that changes. The rock formations are exactly the same. The volcano in the back is in the exact same condition. Even the clouds didn't move after millions and millions of years. So I still buy into the simulation of time travel and they're actually living in the future slash present theory. I still don't understand the train's tale. I couldn't come up with anything for that. Leave in a comment if you know what the fuck that's about. It's really bothering me. And don't say it's just a cartoon, because if it's just a cartoon, you wouldn't be watching this. You wouldn't see me spiral out of control. This is what we do. It's fun. We're having fun! Everyone's going to, I bet you're For the 2021 movie, I'm gonna read through my bullet points. The plot was truly off the wall. Adventure Island is this theme park thing, so they are going full Jurassic Park, and get this, there are robot dinosaurs. Robot. I can't believe they actually went there. I have some bad news. This is the first confirmed teleportation where we saw what was on the other side of a tunnel and that other side was totally detached. It could be teleportation and not time travel, you know what I mean? My theory still isn't completely shattered. And finally, I wanna talk about what didn't give me closure. Because Buddy throughout the series is always talking about, oh, I can't wait to be a big T-Rex. So I thought there would be a, a time jump where we do get to see Buddy as a big T-Rex. We don't. For a show about time travel, it truly feels like no time has passed. It seems like they're all the same age. There was one episode where it was all of their birthdays, so we know at least a year has passed. But with a 12-year runtime, I thought we could see a little bit more. Maybe they're stuck as kids forever? Maybe the asteroid hit? Ah! The dinosaur train is coming to your town! So there were two different versions of this I found online. One was with giant puppets that stayed true to the series. This live production was called Buddy's Big Adventure. It ran for an hour, and from what I found, there were productions of this from 2013 to 2016. Now, like I said, the Buddy's Big Adventure show looks good. I also found this. How many dinosaur species are there? Which looks like it took place in a mall. And instead of utilizing the different sizes of puppets, they're all just stuck in mascot costumes. And they had a whole ass human character interacting with them, which I can't even get into. Actually, wait, yes I can. They really are in the future, my theories confirmed. So that is almost everything I have for you today. I really hope you enjoyed Butt Lovers. The only thing I have left to say is, if I was in charge of a Dinosaur Train live show, I would answer the age old question, what if we made Dinosaur Train a little bit emo? A magical train can't take away the pain of being struck from the sky, wiped out and left to die. When the conductor passes by, I ask why. Don't worry, kiddos, we're just drawings on TV. Wait, what? A funny little show flashing on a screen. Wire his toes out. What we do is meaningless. We aren't kid shows fun. We're reliving our extinction. No, we never existed. Do you feel better now that you know? No. Oh. <laughs> Listen, kid, maybe when we fade into obscurity, it won't be a paleontologist that rediscovers us. It'll be a YouTuber. Now, doesn't that sound fun? No.